Genji for the very kind introduction. Um, so as uh, Angie has said, my work primarily is in forensic psychiatry, but a um, large part of my work also involves running uh, outpatient clinics. And even in the inpatient work that I do, we have to treat individuals with uh, major mental health uh, conditions, um, major mental disorders, and one of which uh, is depression, which is very commonly seen. So I hope in today's talk, I can introduce to the audience the, the key symptoms of depression, how to recognize it, uh, perhaps uh, within ourselves, within the people around us, and what can we do to treat those who have depression. So first of all, I, I would like to walk us through what is normal. When we say we have a normal mental state, basically we are thinking about a few domains such as perception, how we see the world. Uh, the next is uh, about thinking, how we, how we think our thinking process. Thirdly, it is about our emotional control. And finally, self-control in terms of the impulses, how we manage these impulses. So day to day, um, most of us are coping very well, I hope. Uh, and, and these are usually what keeps us going, how we see the world, what we think, how we feel, and how we manage ourselves. Okay, so sometimes you, you may say that um, everything is relative, that because uh, like in the example of this cartoon, I'm very, very happy. But when I want to be very, very, very happy, uh, that's when I got very miserable. But things like that, it, it, it probably illustrates that sometimes the way we, we view ourselves and we view our interactions with the world and the people around us do to a large part influence our mood and, and our interactions with them. So when things become an, an illness, particularly in mental health, is generally when there are three key features. One is you see a, a set of symptoms. The symptoms are something that um, you may report when you're really feeling unwell. Uh, in the case of depression, I'll go through that in a short while. Okay, so there's usually more than one symptom to qualify as an illness, a cluster of them. And when you have the symptoms, you also have distress. So you feel very unwell, you feel very uneasy, and that's when you feel that something needs to be done. Okay, and, you, and finally, you also notice that as a result of the above two, you have a limited capacity to carry out your day-to-day -day life. So sometimes it regards to your studies, and other times it's about your, your work, and many times it's about social relationships with the people around you. So how common is depression? From this table, you can see that it is not uncommon. In major depressive disorder, there is um, around, if you compare between two intervals in 2010, when it was about 5.8% uh, lifetime prevalence, uh, that means in a, in a lifetime prevalence, it means in a population over the lifetime of the individuals there, about 6% can, uh, expect to have a depressive episode, okay? So you, you did a, a measure again, six years later, 2016, it was about 6.3%. So this is perhaps um, one in 25. So it is common. It's important to recognize depression when it happens and how to manage it. So when we talk about symptoms, the key feature that we can identify is we feel down. We feel our mood is low. And it's not just a, a normal mood, low mood, which will go away after a while, okay? Depression's low mood is when it persists most of the day. So it is a struggle. And it went on continuously almost every day for a period of more than two weeks. Nothing can bring it up, no matter uh, what happens around the individual, uh, no matter what ha happens in the course of the day. Okay? So this is when something needs to be done because it's, it's more than just a normal feeling, a normal emotion. It's more to do with what happens inside the body already that will suggest that you will need something um, 
such as medications or other therapies to make it better. Next is about motivation and interest. People who are down with depression would be very unmotivated. Sometimes it's even the task such as getting out of the bed in the early part of the day, getting down to work. Uh, they just can't get their engine going, just, just can't get started in, in things. They have lots of interest. And, and this is quite um, punishing. Imagine there's a hobby that you, you would turn to every time um, at the end of the day, after a busy week to recharge, to feel good, to feel connected, but you no longer, when you have depression, to have any interest in this. And as a result, you participate less in that. And even when you are going through such activities, you feel there's a loss of enjoyment. So that's the reason why people who are depressed often um, had they been playing sports like basketball and run, they find that they, they run less and less. Um, and they like to go out and watch a movie with others. You find that they don't participate no, anymore in this kind of social gatherings and activities. They don't like music anymore when they, they used to love it. And, and it, is, it makes the day bleak most of the day. It makes it, much harder to go by. So we're talking really about anything. So when we ask about depression, for example, in a healthcare context, I might ask, what are the things that you like to do to, to relax and to enjoy? How often would you do that? Um, what about recently? Do you still do that? If not, why? So sometimes you might hear uh, people saying that I, I, I don't really feel like getting out of the house. When I read, I can't focus. I don't enjoy what I'm reading anymore. I used to love food, but um, it seems tasteless now. And when I play sports, it just doesn't have the truth in it anymore. When I'm with people, I don't enjoy the company. It's just like just being there. So it is really, really um, unnerving to most and uh, frustrating to, to many people too. What about sleep? For those who have depression, usually they would, as you would expect, would have a lot of problems sleeping. So in depression generally, uh, like the men to the right, they may, the individuals with depression would usually have problems falling asleep. So it may be for hours much longer than usual. And even when they manage to doze off, the second sleep problems occur. They keep waking up during the night they were meant to sleep again and they wake up many times after that still. But one of the probably the, the, the most um, recognized, recognized feature of sleep problems in depression is what we call early morning wakening, in which individuals will usually wake about two to three hours than the usual time. And despite all attempts, they can't fall asleep after that. So this is to say that if someone is, uh, in, in normal times will wake up on their own about seven-ish, uh, when they're really depressed, they find they wake up about four or five, uh, even though they still feel very tired and nothing can make them go back to bed again. Next is about, this is another uh, class of symptoms, how individuals view the world. So the outlook an individual has is colored. It's almost like looking through dark colored lens where they feel about themselves, a lot of guilt, may have been about what they've done um, recently. Um, it may be justified or unjustified. Even if it's slightly justified, it's usually excessive guilt about what they do. They usually feel worthless about themselves, uh, their abilities, they doubt what they can do, what they're capable of. They doubt their, their role in the family, in, in what they do. And finally, they feel about the future, a sense of hopelessness that um, no matter what they do, nothing will change things for the better. So in depression, the outlook is generally, so in a nutshell, it's about ourselves feeling guilty and worthless, about the future, feeling hopeless, and sometimes about the, the world around them where they feel are uh, uh, unsympathetic, unforgiving, and harsh. Okay, and also, the lack of energy. So we call it lethargy. Um, individuals would uh, probably have to rely a lot more, in this case, like 
coffee and tea to get them throughout the day. Sometimes they find that they have to lie down most of the time. Um, they find themselves nodding off, taking naps in the day. They usually feel um, it's related to motivation, a bit hard to get going, so there's no energy to do anything at all. No energy to go out for a run and uh, to go out with friends and they rather rest at home. So you find them probably lying around most of the time. And this is why sometimes the people around them thought that, hey, this person is very lazy, just doesn't want to get things done. Or do they just snap out of it and just join us? It's sometimes not that easy for people who are depressed. Next is uh, focus. Uh, this is, I, I realize this is around the period of uh, PSLE, major exams in schools. So it's a big problem. Um, particularly in the moment-to-moment -moment concentration. Um, it can affect driving, for example. It can affect when people are studying, ability to take in information and remembering it. Um, people tend to be forgetful. So some individuals who are severely depressed will leave the light on when they are supposed to turn it off, leave the, the gas on, forget to lock their doors, often misplaces their things in the house. They don't know where they place it. So, yeah, from day-to-day -day life to displacing things, it can happen a lot. So again, in order to qualify as a symptom um, of depression, the loss of focus has to be generally um, most of the day, almost every day, for a continuous period, okay? Which differentiates with just normal forgetfulness that all of us are prone to. Next is appetite, okay? Um, individual will feel that who are very depressed will feel that they have no appetite to eat. No, they don't feel like eating anything at all, even though they have no food for a long time. And that leads, uh, in severe cases, to severe weight loss. Uh, in some individuals, however, there's a paradoxical uh, eating a lot and, and sleeping a lot, which we call like, atypical depression. But generally, the hallmark is persistent low mood with problems in appetite. Uh, this is with regards to how we think. So there is a kind of a medical term called psychomotor, psycho is brain and motor is like motor movement, retardation, slowdown, or agitation. Okay, the way we think is slowed down. If, in severe cases, I've seen individuals who talk really slowly uh, from their normal. That's because the brain, the brain itself is slowed down a lot. So like literally finding thoughts could be due to lack of concentration. The general speed of thinking is slowed down. They talk slower, they move very slowly. They turn out to be very indecisive. So it takes a long time to make decisions. What should have been an easy task for them when they're well? And this, they feel a, a sense of loss of life meaning and purpose, and this is, which is why in depression, uh, in severe cases, individuals could feel uh, life is meaningless, or uh, in worst case, feel suicidal and, or entertain suicidal thoughts. Okay, for, for such cases in, in these extremes, it is best to encourage them to seek help, sometimes accompanying them to a mental health service provider will be the most useful, because when you're depressed, your thinking about whether things will change for the better is, is going to be affected. They're not going to be very convinced that anything they do will help. So the people around them uh, should actually encourage them to seek help and treatment early. Just want to talk a little bit about um, the difference, the relationship between arousal, how, uh, how aroused we are and the our performance, okay? So when we are in a slightly anxious state, such as a couple of months before a major exam. So by some measures in mild to moderate degrees of arousal, it can be a good thing. So it compels you to sit down at the desk and study. It compels you to focus for prolonged periods of time. But when there is too much arousal, when you are too anxious and you are fidgety and you keep having thoughts crowding in or what I'm going to do, I'm going to fail. That's when your performance starts to drop. 
So in, in depression, it, it, it may have been uh, there's too little arousal, there's just too little motivation to do anything. And therefore, the, the performance is also affected. So they're just not there at all. So when we are functioning well, it's usually at the kind of optimal range, not too much and not too low. So I think by most, by most things, generally it's good in moderate measures, but not in the extremes. Okay, so you can imagine it can affect you arousal when you are trying to take the exam and in the minute, second to second task that you have to focus on like typing, if you're affected in your thinking, it, it can cause a lot of mistakes. And when you are, there's a strong pressure to perform, uh, it can be very anxiety provoking. Too much of it is never a good thing. So what's the relationship between mental and physical health? We talk of the brain, like sometimes it's a kind of independent organ or function, but you appreciate that sometimes in, in mental health, physical health is very, very important too. So our physical health affects our mental health and vice versa. So if somebody who is depressed, for example, you find that uh, the, sometimes the management of the chronic illnesses like diabetes, high blood pressure or high cholesterol gets affected as well. Sometimes the prognosis for health conditions like um, ischemic heart disease is worse because the individual also has depression. So we don't really know uh, what the direct link. It may be that people who are depressed may sometimes uh, forget to take their medication, may not be motivated to adopt the right lifestyle factors. But generally we see that if depression is not managed well, physical health also suffer. The other way is true as well. In certain physical health conditions, there's a higher uh, risk or chance of having a uh, mood disorder. Generally, these are um, uh, those that are chronic, chronic illnesses with pain as a feature. For example, rheumatoid arthritis, um, when the joints are really bad and often a lot of pain, sometimes uh, depression is quite a common comorbidity. So you have to look out for that and treat it if it happens. So I'm going to go a little bit about the causes of depression because it helps us to understand why um, certain treatments are very important and which areas they're targeting. So in, in depression, we usually talk about um, the biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors that contribute to the depression. Okay. Um, let me just run through the next few slides. Okay. So, the social factors, obviously. Um, talking about the biopsychosocial approach, life events are things that happen in all our lives that causes us to kind of have a, either a soft reset or hard, hard reset of the way we operate, the way we live our lives, the way we think, and the way we interact with our world. So think of the, maybe the obvious things like the death of a close family member, um, divorce uh, um, and having onset of a major physical illness that has a, has a lot of impact on who you are and your lifespan. But it can also happen, life events can also happen in happy circumstances, surprisingly, like um, even marriage, uh, moving to a bigger house, perhaps moving houses, moving schools. So as, as long, no matter whether it's happy or sad in, in, in this origin. This event sometimes does predispose and make it more likely if they're not managed well. Okay. They can actually lead to um, be the precipitant for onset of depression. So there's also biochemical basis of depression in that uh, the reason we give medication is that the the neurons, which are the, the uh, kind of the wiring in the brain, uh, they are the way of transmitting information. They, they use what we call neurotransmitters. Uh, is dysfunctional. It's, it's not operating as they should. Okay, that's because sometimes there are problems in, in the neurotransmitters. Okay, the, how they are broken down, some of them, uh, how they are generated. And that's why the antidepressants are meant to address this, to change the chemicals in the brain. Which is why sometimes I tell my patients that uh, even though 
some some people have a lot of difficulty accepting that they are depressed and that they're mentally unwell. So they may the many explanations that sometimes you just need medication to make sure that the brain functioning is okay so that you have, have improved energy, sleep, concentration, and that so that you can deal better with your social difficulties at hand. Sometimes even if you do the right things through counseling, it may not be sufficient in itself and you still require medication. So the major classes of antidepressant drugs, the older kinds are listed above, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. We don't usually use that much anymore, except in a very small subset of population because it can cause a lot of um, adverse side effects and there are some like, dietary restrictions. So some of the names, um, most of the names, I think most people wouldn't be very familiar with anymore. The, the class of drug that come after that, the tricyclics used to be used fairly commonly. Um, some of you might hear about amitriptyline, for example, um, chromipramine. They generally uh, have much, I guess compared to the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they don't really have much of that three, they don't have dietary restrictions but it can cause quite uh, serious side effects nonetheless. And particularly in overdoses, it can, can be a very bad thing. Okay. Um, so that's why there's ongoing progress and what really uh, perhaps get a lot of progress was made when Prozac was uh, one of the drugs in this class that was discovered and it was widely adopted after that. It's, belong to class of drugs called selective, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And since then we've seen many uh, cousins uh, that come about. Uh, Acetylroplan is something that we commonly use now, especially in the elderly, because there's few side effects. If they happen to be taking other medication as well. Um, Provoxamine is uh, another SSRI, which is very commonly used for depression and for conditions such as obsessive compulsive disorder. So, their yeah, side effects are generally, uh, it's generally sa is safer in overdose, okay, not during, compared to tricyclic antidepressants. And uh, side effects are generally quite mild. If anyway, for all the antidepressants that we see here, even most of the efficacy are about the same. So most of them are about as effective as the other. The only difference is the side effects profile. So even in the class of drugs such as SSRI, if one doesn't work or if, if one, one medicine can be tolerated because of side effects, there's always another medicine to try where the effects will be milder. Okay, so um, the other, the new class of drug will include the serotonin antagonist reuptake inhibitors, which, uh, and the SNRI. So the main neurotransmitter that you probably get are serotonin and norepinephrine. Um, duloxetine, that's the SNRI at the bottom right. We, we use quite often, and likewise, venlafaxine. Again, there are some side effects profile which are unique to these drugs. And it's best to actually discuss with your doctor prior to starting and should you experience any side effects during the administration of the drugs. Okay, this is just another graphical representation. It's just to show that there's uh, so much uh, variety. And maybe what this slide is better than the other. The last one is uh, kind of the main side effects is listed here. Tricyclics, uh, so that's your anticholinergic side effects, which affects dry eyes, dry mouth, difficulty passing motion. Uh, the heart rate also can tend to go up or tricyclics. For the SSRIs, uh, generally it's pretty mild. They may have some indigestion, particularly if you're using fluvoxamine, some gastric discomfort, uh, but most of the time it's pretty okay. Um, for the monoamine oxidase, Inhibitors generally will tell people to avoid fermented like cheese, certain kind of food, and so on. Okay. Um, there's, remember, we talked about biopsychosocial. So, we start from a life event, then the brain, and this is what psychological factors that can contribute to depression. So, there is a concept called learned helplessness that I'll just uh, briefly talk about here. Um, basically, there's an ex experiment done in which if we adopt, um, in this case, there's a shock on the floor, uh, streets on the floor, and the dog has a 
may be given an option whether it can escape from the adversity stimuli or not. So where in the instance where the, the dog can escape from these electric shocks, generally everything is okay after that. There's a kind of a motivation to explore and to get away from adversity stimuli is kind of rewarded in that the shocks go away or it's gone or it's left behind. But in a case where there's no way of escape and the animal finds itself, no matter what it does, the shock still came. So that is when there is a condition where they become very, a condition almost like observable behavior, almost a depression, where they stop trying. They just kind of uh, lack motivation to do anything. They generally appear very depressed and no matter what is done, it will never change things. Okay, so it is a situation that we sometimes find ourselves in that um, the belief that we can't change the cause of negative events, that failure is inevitable and insurmountable, that is not a good be belief to hold on to. And part of the solution lies in the therapy that I'll talk about later on, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, which addresses this kind of um, unrealistic, unreasonable negative cognitions inside us so that we can feel better and uh, not be uh, in a situation of uh, constant helplessness. So because you feel there's a lack of control. So it's, another way of putting it is a locus of control, okay? So if somebody has, the, the control lies inside us and we feel that we can control our destiny, I think you'll be a much happy person with that kind of mindset compared to another person who says that, um, what I do really doesn't change things. People around me, the environment, my environment actually controls my destiny. So in this situation that you have to make do with whatever life dishes out to you. And very often this is uh, something that we, the kind of mindset that we see in people who are very depressed. Okay, so this, this is a picture about talking therapy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the ways you think the ways we think, again, sometimes that can make us uh, depressed. So, um, the, essentially, the, we can divide how we think into two ways. Okay? There's a quick thinking, intuitive, instinctive way of thinking, what we call, we can call automatic way of thinking. And there's a kind of, a, sometimes you need a kind of a rational, deliberate, and that's kind of self-conscious reflection that we can call a kind of reflective system of thinking, kind of like thinking fast and slow. Okay, so if you see a picture like that, so kind of, that kind of uh, engenders certain kind of emotions immediately and some kind of thoughts come into us. Likewise, if you're in that kind of situation, you would feel in a certain way too. Um, and in the third picture is either whether you find that kind of environment relaxing or if you're studying for exams, extremely unnerving because the exam is tomorrow. Okay, finally, if, if there's a severe air turbulence, sometimes it can actually kick off a real automatic system thinking that I'm, I'm gonna die and I can't do anything. It's on the pilot's hands, it's on the, the weather. Um, but really a reflective way of thinking of, think of that in that situation is that the, the incidence of um, air disasters is really very small, particularly due to weather. Okay. So another way of putting it is that sometimes our, our brain doesn't really work the way it should. So try, try this, try to actually read out the words as it is, okay? Uh, I'm sure that most of us will struggle because the, one set of stimuli, the spelling itself tells us that it should be in a certain way, but visually it, it suggests something entirely different. So it just tells us that sometimes how we think, we may not be thinking well or thinking straight because it is how we actually wired our, our habits of thinking. And we're down to the next topic, which is about choice. Again, thinking about locus of control, whether I have control of what I do, about my destiny, about how I choose to feel, that is very, very important. Okay, one, one other very good way of putting it is by 
the psychiatrist and the Holocaust survivor, Victor Frank, who, who I quoted again, this is something that I learned and I appreciate a lot. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Okay, no matter what happens to us, we always have a choice. It's important to remember that. So in psychological therapy, we would cover uh, areas like problem solving, creative thinking, like thinking out of the box, rather than thinking in that kind of uh, the pessimistic mode, assertive expression, negotiation and social skills, how to manage our emotions, uh, reasoning of, about our values and critical reasoning in general. Okay, so creative thinking, I guess, is very important in this context because you really want to think in, in those who are constrained by pessimistic thoughts, really they will feel that the road ahead is, is just very whiny and dark. It's almost like uh, hoping for the light at the end of the tunnel that never comes. Okay, so it's really <laughs> between uh, thinking about what is possible rather than what you find yourself uh, invariably drawn towards. So to give an example about the difference between um, how, uh, like NG has mentioned earlier, how we think affects how we feel. Okay, so if you take this example and ask yourself this question, suppose you're at a party and a friend introduced you to Alex. As you talk, Alex never looked at you. In fact, throughout your brief conversation, he looks over your shoulder across the room. Okay, depending on how we are wired internally, what we call um, automatic thoughts or underlying beliefs, you're going to have several kinds of emotions based on how these are wired. So you could think that Alex is rude, he's insulting me by ignoring me, I'm a very important person. And the postmodern obviously will be irritated, isn't it? If someone thinks that, oh, this person doesn't find me interesting, I, I bore everyone, this is just proof that the next person I talk to, Alex, uh, finds me extremely boring too. And this person will feel sad. Okay, it's like a lack of self-worth, it just reinforces that. But somebody thinks that, oh, yeah, Alex seems shy, he's probably too uncomfortable to look at me. That is how numbers people do, they avoid eye contact. And in this case, you have a very different emotional response. You feel, oh, you feel sorry. There's some sense of caring and empathy in that interaction. Okay, so this is what uh, really cognitive behavior therapy is about. So as I explained to patients before I refer them for CBT, it is that sometimes the way we think um, keeps us that way if you continue to feel depressed. So CBT, what it tries to do is to look at some of these cognitive distortions that the, the same kind of situation can evoke different emotions. And in the individual uh, who is depressed, you always evoke the same kind of reaction as that of the depressed one. So you see that um, there are certain kinds of distortions that are names to that uh, personalization. For example, this is my fault, this everything is about me making mistakes. Um, selective extraction is about drawing conclusions on the basis of one particular feature of a situation. Okay, if a project comes out to be very good, but they found that oh, actually the, there's a few typo errors and that just means that you're so careless and useless because of the typos and you feel really bad about that. This is just start picking the small thing and then you're saying that, oh, I, I feel depressed as a result. Sometimes people have uh, what they call minimization. Uh, they downplay certain things and they try to kind of maximize something that they choose to focus their attention on. Some people overgeneralize, make sweeping conclusions. Sometimes people make a mountain out of a moho, so to speak, and so on. So in, in, in CBT, it is firstly about being aware, being aware of this um, negative patterns of thinking starting to identify them um, in the context of the situation and how I feel and understanding why, why it can lead to doing like that and constantly challenging the, your, 
negative automatic thoughts. Sometimes these thoughts are unrealistic. Most of the time they're unrealistic. Um, being overly harsh than they should on ourselves and it causes us to think that way. So I always tell them that CBT is really about making you feel, uh, how do I put it? Okay, it, it is about avoiding feeling sad because you feel you tend to sitting in extreme circumstances and making life more realistic because you see the world in a more realistic manner and you realize that this is actually probably an extreme reaction to feel sad when in most people it doesn't evoke that kind of emotions. So there is a kind of a self, there's a, this is a, I thought it's a really good book, kind of self-help CBT. As you, as you read through it, there's exercises. It brings you through being aware of your, uh, your mood, the exercises uh, that links the situation to the thoughts inside you and try to identify the negative thoughts and negative patterns of thinking and to change it. There's also a couple of chapters of relaxation exercises and so on. It's nice in second edition. Um, when I was learning about CBT, um, this is one of the books that I, I bought, which I, I think was, was really useful even as a kind of a trying to teach others about CBT, to be on ourselves and learn new things about ourselves. Okay, just a, uh, so related to that is a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. It kind of combines the cognitive behavior techniques with mindfulness strategies. So in order to help individuals better understand and manage their thoughts and emotions to achieve relief from feelings of distress. So uh, CBT teaches us to kind of, first of all, I think it's kind of inherent in CBT as well that you have to be aware of your emotions. Okay, for some people, they struggle with CBT because it's kind of hard to describe how they feel, but some are really articulate and able to say that I feel this, I feel that. They feel something and they're able to articulate it out. And then we try to link it to the situation. So what causes you to feel depressed or angry in a situation? So in, then they may have, they have to analyze or this aspect or the interaction causes them to be depressed or angry. Um, what kind of thoughts are evoked? So as they list the situation, then they start to realize a pattern. There's a pattern in the, how they think that leads invariably to certain emotions. Okay, so they are able to un understand and identify the negative automatic thoughts and the uh, underlying belief, negative underlying beliefs and try to change it. So sometimes we try, we try to challenge the individual's emotions uh, and thinking, I think that, um, is there other possibilities that this thing happened that might not lead you to think that you are the result of uh, something bad? So there's the kind of thought challenges, there's kind of uh, exercises that led them to try experiments and test situations. And they find that, hey, actually I probably has attributed too much blame and guilt on myself than I should. It's really not the case. So, sorry, back to, my first is cognitive therapy. Again, um, this is developed by Zinder Sager, Mark Williams, and John Tisdale from the earlier works of uh, Tisdale, John Kabat Zin, and uh, Philip Bernard. So I realized that um, they actually published something specific to depression and mindfulness based cognitive therapy for depression in the currently in the second edition by the, the same authors. Okay. So this is back, this is a summary slide, more or less. So key facts. Depression is a common mental disorder. Globally, I think that more than 260 million people of all ages suffer from depression. It's a leading cause of disability worldwide and it's a major contributor to the overall global burden of disease. So think about it as uh, when you're depressed, even if you go to work, you're not that productive. It actually takes more time and effort and a lot of times people also had, uh, had to be absent from work as a result of depression. Um, more women are affected by depression than men. Remember that depression sometimes can lead to extreme circumstances like suicide. And there are effective psychological and pharmacological treatment for moderate and severe depression. Okay, this is from WHO. Um, in context, generally for mild to moderate depression, 
sometimes uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and on its own will be effective. Um, sometimes uh, for these conditions, pharmacological medications will be effective. Very often, I find it's more effective to have both. That means to start a person on medication and also to try the psychological intervention. Because what I always tell patients is that when on medication, the effect will last as long as it's taken. So when medication is being taken off, uh, you can expect that there's a risk of a relapse. Okay. But in psychological therapies, you learn the skills of managing stress, of seeing the world in a more adaptive way. And these skills stay with you even after the therapy. So you know, they, they work in different mechanisms as well and they can complement each other. So for severe depression, however, I would, I would say that most would require pharmacological treatment, even physical treatments, what we call electroconvulsive therapy. But generally for mild, uh, there's no, no harm starting off with psychological interventions and thinking about when to start people on medication. And for moderate, you might see both. Okay, just a quick word on resilience. Uh, this is moving away from treating sicknesses and illnesses to positive mental health. Is, I think it's important we talk about biopsychological and social. So this is really about the importance of social connectedness. So all of us are human beings. We need to feel that there is a role and a purpose in the context of a wider world. It is important to have a caring and supportive relationships with the people around us. Uh, to feel uh, perhaps gratitude about uh, having these opportunities and constantly reminding others that uh, in some ways, uh, in many ways, they're important to us too and we hope they feel the same. Okay, so in there's a positive mental health instrument that uh, this kind of, is a study done in, uh, in IMH. Six dimensions that contribute to positive mental well-being how we cope generally, coping stars is important, emotional support, spirituality, skills, personal growth and autonomy, and the, if, how we manage our emotion global effect. So uh, and there's a, if, if you have not seen this video, uh, please watch it, it's by World Health Organization, it's on YouTube, and you just search, I had the red dot, his name is depression. It kind of, uh, somewhere in the, in a way that's easy to connect to what I just talked about in the past uh, 15 minutes. It's easy to remember after that.